All right, how y'all doing this morning? So, back in the late 1980s, Digital Equipment Corporation, DEC, was the world's second largest computer manufacturer, behind only the 500-pound gorilla of the industry, IBM. See, back in those days, if you wanted to use a computer, you would first have to clean out your basement, you would uh, buy this giant monolithic machine, you would hire a team of acolytes to run it for you. So computing power was really scarce. It was really expensive. It was reserved for only the most high value of business tasks. So if you wanted to use a computer, you would first have to get in line behind all of the people who were running payroll and calculating insurance premiums. You'd have to come in in the middle of the night. Computing power just wasn't for everybody. So Digital Equipment Corporation, DEC, made the mark on their industry, made their mark on the industry with what they called mini computers. So instead of being the size of your basement, it was like the size of a large refrigerator. <laughs> And so the foundation of their success was, you know, started in the 60s and 70s with their PDP line of mini computers. And this, what this enabled them to do was to get computing power into the hands of people who never had it before. So say an individual engineering team might be able to have their own computer or an academic department could buy a computer for their group. In fact, even an individual theater troupe might buy one of these things to run the lights for their shows. And so, DECA innovated over the 60s and the 70s with their PDP line of computers, culminating in this sexy badass right here, the PDP-8, okay? So, the PDP-8 was, at the time, the most popular computer on the market. They sold these things like hotcakes. I have this fantastic photograph. Um, it's this like super grainy black and white photo and it would reproduce terribly, so I can't actually show it to you here. But what it shows is a farmer who has loaded one of these things onto the back of his tractor so that he can do computerized operations of his potato picking, <laughs> which is insane. But as far as I'm concerned, makes the PDP-8 here the world's first mobile computer. <laughs> this is Ken Olson. He's their CEO. Doesn't he look happy? Look how happy he is. Doesn't he look happy? Well, why shouldn't he be happy? I mean, he is the CEO of the world's second largest computer manufacturer. He has a track record of research and innovation. He has his finger on the pulse of the marketplace. He has put out his most wildly successful line of computers ever. He deeply understands what his customers want, and he is continually innovating to bring out products that meet the needs of his customers. And he feels confident that there is no reason <laughs> why anyone would have a computer in their home. I mean, <laughs> why would you want that? <laughs> it doesn't square with anything that Ken Olson knows about the computer industry, and Ken Olson knows a lot about the computer industry. I mean, that's not how people want to use a computer. That's not why someone wants to use a computer. That doesn't match up with anything that he has heard any of his customers tell him about how someone wants to use a computer. If your organization is anything like a lot of the organizations that I talk to, you may have someone who is saying right now, well, there's no reason anybody's gonna wanna do that on mobile. <laughs> I mean, why would you wanna do that on your phone? That's not what phones are for. That doesn't square with how anybody expects to use a phone. That doesn't make any sense. Why would you wanna do that? So, 1988. DEC has moved on from their wildly successful line of PDP mini computers to the even more wildly successful line of VAX mini computers. Some of you may still even be running these things. So this is the VAX 11. It is the first computer with a 32-bit mainframe architecture. They are also selling their 
wildly popular, incredibly popular VT125 integrated graphics terminal. Okay, now this thing, this thing is being sold like like crazy to people who are running Vax computers, but also to people who are running any any computer by any manufacturer. Like this thing, it's like it can do custom fonts, it can do charts and graphs, rainbows shoot out of these things. <laughs> look at this guy here. Doesn't he look happy? Okay, you can't see how happy he is because of like the giant Magnum PI mustache, but I assure you, this guy could not be happier with his use of the Vax 11 32-bit mainframe architecture and the VT125 integrated graphics terminal. In the 1980s, DEC sold 400,000 of these things. Like, they were at the top of their game. They, they were selling more computers than they had ever sold before. Their market was completely satisfied with everything that they were doing. And they had no reason to believe that their entire industry was going to be destroyed by one of these cheap pieces of crap. <laughs> I mean, look at them. This is not the VT125 integrated graphics terminal. This is a black and white television set from Radio Shack. This is not the Vax 11 32-bit mainframe architecture. It's a cassette tape deck. It stores its memory on a cassette tape. It's only got the one dumb little rainbow on it. Rainbows don't even shoot out of these things. Okay, it is 1988. DEC is the world's second largest computer manufacturer. They are the second largest employer in the state of Massachusetts, behind only the state government. In 1990, just two years later, they post their first quarterly loss, and they start laying people off. 1991, a year after that, they post their first full year loss. DEC would lose money in five out of the next seven years. And in 1998, just a decade later, DEC is gone. They are acquired by the manufacturer of the personal computer. This has got to be some kind of crazy fluke, right? I mean, this just must be completely unprecedented in the history of American business. I mean, there is just no way that Ken Olson could have ever anticipated that something like this would happen, right? Wrong. In industry after industry, the new technologies that brought the big established companies to their knees they weren't better. They weren't more advanced. They were actually worse. The new products were low-end, dumb, shoddy, and in almost every way, inferior. Almost. Clayton Christensen had a theory, and he called it disruptive innovation. And what this theory states is that disruption happens from the low end. The tech industry likes to talk about disruption a lot, and I think it's really important when you talk about this to actually get at what Christensen meant with this theory. What he meant was that a new technology comes on the market, and even though it isn't as good as its higher end predecessor. It doesn't work as well. It isn't as fast. It doesn't have as much capability. It isn't as full featured. What this low end product does, it does better than anything else out there in the marketplace. And that is that it creates an entirely new market for that product or service. And in creating that new market, in developing an entirely new set of customers for this product, eventually, that low-end product gets good enough. And so no one needs to use the higher-end product anymore. And this has happened time and time and time again. 
Imagine it's the 1930s and you've bought one of these gorgeous furniture radios for your parlor or your living room. Look at it, it's beautiful, right? I mean, it's got this like hand-tooled wood. It has rich, resonant sound. I mean, you imagine that you purchase this as an heirloom that you want to pass down to your children. You imagine gathering the family around it to listen to music or radio programs in the evening, and you're going to lovingly maintain this beautiful piece of furniture so that you can maintain it in your home for decades to come. Except your teenager buys one of these cheap pieces of plastic so she can take it to the beach. Transistor radios, they weren't better. They were cheap and plastic. The sound was tinny. It was hard to tune them. And yet, transistor radios did one thing that no other product in the market could. They put the power of having a radio of your very own into the hands of teenagers. And there were so many of those teenagers, and the demand for music and sports programs and having their own radio was so great that over time, transistor radios became good enough. Within a decade or so, no one needed to buy a big piece of furniture anymore. No one needed to send off this big piece of furniture to be repaired, because a transistor radio eventually became good enough. The names of the craftsmen who would have worked on these, these furniture radios, like, who are they? Their names are lost to time. The name of the company that made the first transistor radio they were called Sony. Or what about printers? Anybody have an offset printer in their office? No? Well, why not? They're better. An offset printer, sure, okay, yes. There is a higher cost up front to purchase an offset printer. But then, once you have it, you get a higher quality of print at a lower per unit cost. I mean, isn't that what matters to you in a printer? I mean, if you're thinking about what you want in a printer, and I said, hey, don't you want to get the best quality printout? And don't you want to pay the lowest amount of money for that printout? Isn't that what you would say? <laughs> well, obviously not, because you all, you all did. You went out and bought the cheapest inkjet printer you could get. Where the cost of the ink is really expensive, it makes a really crappy printout, you're paying more for a really crappy printout. And the only real benefit that you get from that inkjet printer is that you can hook it up to your computer and you can be like, mine, my, my printer, mine, no one can use it, it's mine. You don't want to walk down the hall and have to talk to your coworkers. And so instead, you buy the worst quality printer in the marketplace just so you can have a printer of your very own. Or we've all seen this happen with photography, right? So when digital cameras came on the marketplace, everybody knew that digital film was going to overtake the demand for film cameras, OK? That, that everybody saw that the world was going to go toward digital. What people did not see, what people did not anticipate, was that digital cameras or digital photography was going to disrupt the market for cameras themselves. So other than the people who are now investing in the super high-end cameras, most people make do with the camera that they have that's in their pocket all the time. It's called their phone. No one needs to buy a point-and-shoot camera anymore. They satisfy, they make do with a camera that's not as good, it doesn't offer as many features, it doesn't work as well as another camera, but it's good enough for them. Kodak is bankrupt. Instagram is worth a billion dollars. That is disruptive innovation. So you can kind of see where I'm going with this one, right? In the same way that DeX mini computers disrupted the market for higher end mainframes, and in the same way that the personal computer disrupted the market for DeX mini computers, right now, today, we are witnessing the latest revolution in disruptive innovation. And it comes from the computing device that sits in the palm of your hand. One of Clayton Christensen's most embarrassing predictions was that the iPhone would fail. Steve Jobs showed him a prototype, and Christensen looked at it, and all he saw 
was a really expensive cell phone. Now, Christensen's a low-end guy, so all he saw was a, was a device that was pegged to the very top of the market, a luxury device for people who could afford to buy any cell phone they wanted. What he did not see was a really cheap computer, really cheap access to the internet for a population of people who otherwise could not get it. The digital divide in this country is real. It is easy to think that the digital divide is something that is limited only to the developing world, only to people who do not have access to personal computers or broadband. But right here in America today, the population of people who do not have internet access, who do not have computers, is significant. For somebody like me, I've had internet access for 20 years. I have three or four computers at home, and that doesn't even include all the mobile devices that I own. It is easy to lose sight of the fact that not every American has access to the power of the internet and the power of computing technology that people like us take for granted. Right now in America today, 20% of Americans have no internet access at all. Now that's an interesting number, but it's not nearly as interesting to me as the second number, which is that 35% of Americans have no internet access at home. Now, think about the kind of things that you do on the internet in the privacy of your own home that you might not want the prying eyes of a boss or a coworker or somebody at the library looking over your shoulder watching you do it. I don't know what you're thinking about, but I'm thinking about <laughs> checking your bank statement, researching a personal medical condition, looking for a new job, heck, even shopping for Christmas presents. These are all things that we take for granted, that we can do from the privacy and the comfort of an always-on personal internet connection. More than a third of Americans do not have that luxury. Now, these numbers look at all Americans. As you might imagine, the numbers are even higher for the population of people who have been, say, traditionally disadvantaged in this country. For example, 29% of black Americans do not have internet access at all, and a whopping 51%, more than half, don't have a broadband connection, don't have internet access at home. These numbers are about the same for Hispanic Americans. It's about a third that have no internet access, and about half don't have a connection at home. Do you think that you are an equal opportunity employer? Do you think that you are upholding your organization's values for outreach? if you are not reaching people on the internet? Beyond that, 38% of low-income Americans have no internet access, and almost 60% don't have a connection at home. And think about it, like you're struggling to pay the rent, put gas in the car, put food on the table. Having an internet connection may seem like a far-off luxury, but Low-income Americans without internet access are increasingly finding the tools for escaping poverty to be out of reach without access to the internet. 80% of Fortune 500 employers only advertise their job listings online. For these Americans, not having access to the internet doesn't mean that they're robbed of the ability to look at funny cat gifs. It means that they are unable to get the jobs or the services or the support that they need to house and clothe and feed their families. If you are a disabled American, 46% of people with a disability have no internet access, and again, almost 60% don't have a connection at home. Imagine if you had a, a motion disability or a hearing disability or you were blind. Think how much bigger the world that you live in would be if you had the connection and the community and the support and the resources that you might get through connecting with people on the internet. I think it is especially sad that these people who are the most vulnerable and the most need of these services are cut off from them increasingly because they no longer have access to the internet. And if you don't have a high school diploma in this country, 
57% of people with no high school diploma don't have access to the internet. And a whopping 88% don't have a connection at home. I mean, think about it. You don't have a high school diploma, so that means that you don't have a job. So that means that you don't have any money. So that means you don't have internet. And that leaves crystal meth. You awkwardly laugh now. If I took your home internet connection away, I, you'd be stockpiling cold medicine in like two weeks. <laughs> be like an episode of Breaking Bad in here. So not everybody has access to the internet. You wanna know what everybody does have? Everybody has a phone. Everybody has a phone. Everyone has a phone. 91% of people in this country have a mobile device today. Mobile phone ownership is not seen as a luxury. It is not seen as something that is only available to the rich people in this country. Mobile phone ownership is seen as a basic staple of American life. It is not unlike having a landline was back in the 70s and 80s. It is not like having a television set today. Everyone in America has a phone. I guarantee you that over the next couple of years, you will see this number edge up from 91%. It hasn't even gone up that much in the last few years, 89% to 91%. It's gonna go up to about 95%, and that number is never going to change for the rest of our lives. Everyone in this country will have a phone. You wanna know what has changed from 2009 to today? It's the number of people who say that they have ever accessed the internet from a mobile device. That number has skyrocketed to 63% of Americans. 63% of Americans say that they have gone online using a phone or another mobile device. I mean, there's no question as to why this is happening, right? It's smartphones. Now that people have access to smartphones, now that it is possible for someone to access the internet from a mobile device, they are choosing to do so. so I think sometimes it's easy, when you look at numbers like this, to fall into the trap of believing that there is a smartphone market and a non-smartphone market. And you know there may be to some extent, but I believe that it's not unlike the market was for black and white television sets back in the day. So there was a period of time where some people had colored TVs and other people had black and white TVs. That didn't mean that there was this un increasing and unmet demand for black and white TVs. It didn't mean that black and white TV was in competition with, with color TVs. It just meant that over the couple of decades that it took for people to replace their television sets, that eventually everybody had a color TV. That, I believe, other than for a small subset of, of simple living people, is what you're going to see happen with smartphones. It means that as people replace their phones, as more and more cheap Android devices become the default option for someone's mobile device, you will start to see these numbers also become equal. There will not be a difference between mobile phone ownership and smartphone ownership. Those numbers will be the same. And so this, this trend has led to a rise in what I like to call the mobile-only user. So the mobile-only user is the population of people who say that they only or mostly access the internet from their mobile device. Their mobile phone is their primary way of accessing the internet. So right now, today in America, of that 63% of Americans who say that they have ever used their mobile phone to go online, 34%, more than a third, say that that is the only way that they only or mostly go online. 34%. Do you know how many millions, how many tens of millions of Americans this is? How many conversations have you had about how to provide a good experience for the people who are coming in on Internet Explorer? Heck, how many conversations have you had about, uh, about how to provide a good experience for the 2% of users who browse with JavaScript turned off? This number is substantially higher than that. Are you having the same conversations in your organization about how to provide a great experience for your customers, for your audience, who will never, ever see your website except through the window of a tiny little mobile device? So right now, this is 34% of people who I would describe as mobile only or mobile primary. If you take this 34% and you add to it the 11% of people who say that they use their mobile device about half of the time, and I'm gonna put myself in that category, I bet a lot of you are in that category, this number then becomes 45% of Americans who say 
that they use the internet on mobile about half the time or more. About half of the people use their mobile device about half of the time. If that number isn't big enough to make you want to do something about it, when will it be? So this number, again, this looks at all Americans. Similarly, the population of Americans, the population of low-income Americans, who say that they only or mostly use the internet on mobile is 45%. Looking at high school educated Americans, that number is also 45%. If you look at black Americans, that number, this, this data comes from the most recent Pew Internet and American Life study. The number of black Americans who say this year, in, 20, in 2013, say that they, they access the internet on mobile is 43%. I put an asterisk here because the number that we had in 2012 was 51%. And I'm willing to bet you guys, I don't think that number went down. I think that survey data gets a little bit wonky sometimes. I am willing to bet you that when the 2014 numbers come out, that that number is gonna be a lot more closely aligned with the number of Hispanic Americans who say that they access the internet solely on mobile, which is 60%. The population of people who only ever see your website on mobile devices is growing. And this goes well beyond just these populations of people who I might say are traditionally disadvantaged. If you want to reach young adults, teens aged 12 to 17 report that half of them only or exclusively access the internet on their mobile device. That number is the same for young adults aged 18 to 29. Half of them say that their mobile device is their primary way of accessing the internet. And so mobile was the final frontier in the access revolution. Mobile is what has erased the digital divide. A mobile device is the internet for many people. And so that's why it's great that we're doing such a good job on mobile, guys, right? <laughs> Sadly, it is untrue. 44% of the Fortune 100, I will let you do the math on that one yourself, 44% <laughs> say that they don't have a mobile website at all. And in doing some analysis of the way that, that the, the majority of them that do have a mobile website, the way that they're coded, only six of the Fortune 100 had a mobile website that met all of Google's best practices for presenting content and information so it would be searchable and findable on mobile. Six. Similarly, 84% of consumer brands say that they don't have a mobile strategy at all. And probably likely, as why this is, only 14% of consumer brands say that they're happy with the results that they're getting on mobile. It's probably because they don't have a strategy. The numbers are the same for, about the same for B2B brands. 80% of B2B brands say that they don't have a mobile strategy. The other 20% are basically saying that they're just throwing stuff up against the wall to see if it sticks. And so as a result, the experience that most organizations are giving to mobile users is subpar. Let's say you come here and you're like, oh, yes, oh, nice, big, tappable buttons. Oh, that looks great. Oh, this feels good. I love it, except wait. Uh, I can only do three things here, and uh, none of them are what I want to do. Oh, oh, I get it. I have to go to the real website to do that. I've got to go to the website that everybody cares about to do that. And oh, yeah, then I've got to go pinching and zooming my way through this screen that was designed for a monitor that's five times the size. This is ergonomic lunacy to expect that users are going to pinch and tap and zoom their way through our real website. Most users shouldn't be, shouldn't be expected to do this. We are better than this as an industry. Or, hey, you guys want to try some cigarettes? Cigarettes are delicious. You should totally try cigarettes. If you are an adult smoker, why, you can go right to Marlboro.com, and there's going to be some nice, easy to fill out form fields there. You know what? You can just type in your birth date, and they're just going to go send you cigarette marketing. It's going to be amazing. You're going to love it. Oh, except. I'm sorry, there's just this one little thing. Uh, cigarettes can kill you. Um, they're kind of legally mandated to tell you that cigarettes can kill you, but they don't really have to make that nearly as easy for you to do, right? I mean, sure, I guess you can figure it out. I mean, if you want to go and find out information about how the health risks of cigarettes or how cigarettes might kill you, well, you can just tap on that and, oh, sure, that's great, right? You can totally read that. Or have you ever tried to search for something on mobile? Well, sure you have. 
you go and you type what you want into Google and you hit search and you're like, oh yeah, oh, oh yeah, that's totally what I want. That's the page that I want right there and I'm just gonna tap on it and... <laughs> Wait, how, wh why, why am I here? How, how did I wind up here? That isn't what I wanted. Should I, should I tap back and try it again? Do I go looking around here? Uh, maybe I should go to the real website. The real website might have it. Something that should take one tap from search results, one tap to get to the page that Google knows is there, winds up being a frustrating hunt and peck through not one but two separate websites, trying to find a page that the user knows exists on Google. We broke Google for these people. How, on, how is that in any way a good experience? And so as a result, the mobile-only user is treated as a second-class citizen. They are treated as somebody who doesn't get as good of experience as the real customer who's using the real website, the one that we really care about, you know, the one we put so much work and time into, the one where we fought about what was going to go on the homepage. Instead, the mobile-only user gets a subpar experience where they get shoddy, inadequate, incomplete content, badly formatted navigation, a frustrating hunt and pack, a pinch and zoom experience. We are better than this as an industry. We deserve better, our customers deserve better than this. So what are we gonna do? So I wanna be clear about this. There is probably no one out there who is more sympathetic to the challenges that organizations face in trying to figure out how do they take their existing desktop strategy, their existing web strategy, and translate that for something on mobile. In fact, that is all I do every single day. I go out and talk to organizations about how they're going to make decisions, how they're going to make choices. And so I am genuinely sympathetic to organizations that are struggling with these choices. And I want to make it clear to people, I do not expect that you run out of here today and be like, oh my god, Karen said we have to throw up a mobile website. We, gotta, we, gotta, we better get that up right now. In fact, I would much rather that instead of jumping into developing a mobile website, you sit down first and figure out what is your strategy going to be for how you connect with people across the wide range of devices and platforms that you can expect them to want to engage with you on. You need a content strategy for mobile. And this is super weird and random. I don't know how these things happen, but uh, I happen to have a book of the exact same title. It came out from a book apart. You can buy it at abookapart.com. So I want to spend the rest of my time with you giving you some things that you can do right, starting right now. You can go back to your office and start helping you figure out how you're going to develop a strategy for mobile that will, in fact, help you with your overall digital strategy. It will make your efforts to communicate with people more effective regardless of the platform or device that they are using to connect with you. So the first thing that you can do is you can understand what your publishing workflow is. So I work with a lot of organizations on their content strategy. And one of the things that I will often do when I start talking to an organization is I'll come in and I'll say, let's get all of the people who are responsible for contributing content to the website into a room and let's map out their workflow. Let's figure out, hey, what happens from the moment that somebody decides I would like to put a piece of content on the internet all the way through that, the point where that content goes live, all the way through the point where someone decides to take that content down? And then I get some hysterical laughter from the audience, from the people I'm talking to, and they're like, <laughs> Karen, uh, we, we don't know who can publish content to the website. Uh, we don't have a workflow defined for that. We don't really understand our publishing process. The challenge for many organizations is that their publishing process, they have, they have distributed the questions of who's creating content, what happens offline, what happens online. They don't know the answers to those questions. And so as a result, they don't know where their pain points are, where their bottlenecks are. And worse than that, many of these organizations that I talk to have developed an even worse bottleneck, an even worse pain point which is that they have baked into the very fabric of their organizational chart that there is a difference between the team that is working on the web and the team that is working on mobile. And they have incentivized the mobile team 
to go off and do something different, to make a mobile app, to make a separate mobile website, to connect with customers differently on mobile than on the desktop or on the, on the, on the real web. And so as a result, their organization has built into their org chart, has built into their review structure, has built into the, the way that people are incentivized, a conflict between those two channels. Your customer, your, your audience, they don't care whether they're accessing you on web or mobile or desktop. What they care about is getting the information and the resources that they want and need. And so having this kind of distinction, division baked in to the website and the mobile app means that the user will inherently get a different experience. Comcast, for example, has this page on their desktop website called Understanding Your Bill. Comcast realized, oh, you know what? We have users that are coming in from mobile devices. We had better figure out how to deliver information to them. So they created a completely separate page, which on mobile, I guess because mobile smaller, is just called Understand Your Bill. <laughs> and they went through and they edited down what were long, flabby paragraphs of text on the desktop website. And they made them short, clear, concise, punchy sentences and paragraphs on mobile. The mobile website is better. But if the mobile website is better, why isn't that just the website? I mean, why are they maintaining two completely separate versions of this page just so that they can have a separate desktop and mobile site? You can tell that they are because the date on which the desktop website and the mobile website were last updated are different. So now, Every time they want to change a type, you know, fix a typo or change a description or edit something, they have to do it in two places. They forked their website into separate mobile and desktop versions, which means that now every time they want to make a change, they have to do it two times. People don't have time to maintain this. I tell you, it's not a strategy if you can't maintain it. My goal for you is not that you wind up with a mobile website in the end. My goal for you is that you wind up with the ability to manage and maintain your content and your services across all of the different platforms or devices that someone's going to need to connect with you on. And that means having a strategy that takes into account figuring out what you want to do on mobile, how you want to prioritize the information so that it's meaningful for people. So that leads me to my second point. Another thing that you could be doing right now, you could go back to your desk and do this. You could write better. Mm -hmm. Yep, you could clean up the way that you write. <laughs> so one of my little pet peeves in this industry is people who write articles that say things like, here's four tips for writing mobile website text. Here's how to write for mobile, top 10 tips. Here's how to write content for mobile sites. Illustrated by a picture of a man using his laptop outside. <laughs> I think this one sums up my impressions of this how to write for mobile meme. And you know, I, I, I understand where this comes from, right? I mean, mobile users are seen as, you know, rushed and distracted and they can't concentrate and nobody's ever going to pay attention to their phone long enough to actually read something, <laughs> right? I mean, that's the whole attitude we have toward mobile users. Thing is, it's not true. See, mobile users are every bit as engaged and focused on good content as anybody else is on the web. In fact, I think they're more engaged. Conversely, your readers have always been rushed and distracted and more interested in their own goals than they are in your messages. So you see, there's no such thing as how to write for mobile. It's just good writing. And the same principles that we've been telling people about how to write for mobile are the exact same principles we've been telling people about how to write for the web, and the exact same things we've been telling people about just how to write good professional communication. Write short, com you know, clear sentences. Put the most important ideas up front. Get to the point. Break up the, he the text with headings and bullet points. Do all of the things that are kind to your reader to help them get to the information that they need. You don't have to do that for mobile. You just do that for everybody. The American Cancer Society wrestled with these same challenges when they were thinking about what should they do for their mobile strategy. Should they 
edit down their articles to the fun sized candy bar version? Should they deliver only a subset of their content on mobile? Should they focus on the needs of the on the go cancer patient? No, the American Cancer Society, when faced with this challenge, they looked at their data about the types of people who were coming to their website. And they realized that the population of people who were more likely to access the American Cancer Society website from a mobile device matched up really neatly with the populations of people who are less likely to get health care in this country. The people I talked about earlier who are the mobile only users are the people who are less likely to get the preventive care and cancer screenings that they need in order to catch cancer in time. And so they concluded that they had a life-saving imperative to get all of their content on mobile. All of it. Not a subset, not a watered down version. All of their content. And so they did. I think this website is a beautiful example of how they were able to take fantastic content, meaningful information, and find a home for it on mobile. And when you look at the type of information that they are presenting, this is not trivial, casual information. This is not a light read. This is information for people who are newly diagnosed or have a family member who is newly diagnosed. And they didn't remove one word. They didn't water it down a bit. In fact, I would go so far as to say that the mobile website is better. It's a more focused, easy to read experience. And they didn't have to change anything in their content in order to make this happen. David Belcom, who is their head of digital, said, it's not that this was designed and written for mobile. It's just good content. See, good content transcends platform. If you have information, if you have resources, if you have services, if you have something that people want, they are going to want it from you on whatever device or platform they happen to have in their hand. So if you have information that you feel confident provides value to your audience, you don't need to worry about dumbing it down or simplifying it or making it smaller just so it will fit on a mobile device. People will still want it. But conversely, if you have content that you fear isn't providing value, if you're not sure if it's resonating with your audience, if you think you just have a bunch of, of cruft that's cluttering up your page, here's your chance to clean it up. And you have my permission. If the conversation that you need to have in order to make that happen is to wave a tiny little smartphone screen in somebody's face and be like, no, no, so tiny, can't fit it all, got to pare it down, must clean it up, please do so with my blessing. But you're not just doing that to make a better experience for mobile users. You're doing that to make a better experience for everyone. And so finally, I want to talk a little bit about a process that I believe that organizations need to go through when they are thinking about how they are going to publish their content on mobile. And I describe it as, you need to chunk your blobs. So right now, today, on the web, we have content that exists in a big, messy glop of a field. Maybe you're using WordPress, or maybe you have content that's stored in a wiki. And those fields are a confusing mix of the content the presentation, you've got images and flash slideshows and everything in the kitchen sink dumped into that one giant blob of a field. And the problem is that when it comes time to take that content to another platform, it is very difficult to go back in and separate out and clean it up and restructure it in a way that will be appropriate for presentation on another platform. Chunks of content are clean, well-structured, presentation-independent bits of content that you have created and stored and managed with the intent that they can and will live on a variety of different platforms. Let me show you an example of this. So Amazon, you've heard of Amazon, right? So Amazon is one of those sites that just has you know, this, the everything in the kitchen sink desktop website. I mean, they've just got, I mean, this page goes on forever. And so when Amazon is thinking about how do they make choices about what to do on mobile, they have to look at their desktop page and ask themselves things like, well, what are we going to keep? What are we going to, what are we going to get rid of? Is everything on this desktop page something that provides value? Or is there stuff that we know we can go in and cut right now? Should we take a long page, like this infinitely scrolling desktop page on, uh, and that Amazon has for one of their products, can we take that and boil that down, make that shorter, break it into shorter chunk chunks of pages? If we're going to do that, 
what is it going to take for us to use the content that we have on desktop and have that work on a mobile device? Can they take something that's a heading on desktop and have that translate for mobile? Well, look here. The headings that they have, product features from the manufacturer, product description, those worked really well when they were headings that just broke up a long run of body copy about products on their desktop page. But as they broke this page into smaller chunks for mobile, something that used to be a heading is now standing in for navigation. Let's say my job here today is that I've come in and I want to know how much this camera weighs. Like, I'm curious, how, how, how much am I going to have to carry around here? How heavy is it? Where am I going to find that? Product features from the manufacturer? Product description? I don't know. None of those headings are sufficiently descriptive to tell me what's going to happen when I tap. But that's cool, right? Because there's all of this body copy in there that's used as a teaser to sort of explain to me what's in each of those sections. So surely, when I read some of this text on the page, it's going to tell me where I should tap. No. When you look at this page, you realize that all they are doing is repeating the megapixels and the zoom of the camera over and over and over again. The only unique content on that page is make memories and share joy. And so as they're thinking about what they do with the content that they have on the desktop, they say, oh, how are we going to make choices? And what are we going to do if something that we know works really well on desktop isn't going to work when now we're thinking about taking our content to another platform? So I talk to a lot of organizations about how they're going to think about their mobile strategy. And I talked to a company recently where I gave a very similar talk to this. And a woman in the audience raised her hand. And she's like, I've been wondering when you were going to mention responsive web design. See, we're going to use responsive design. And I'm like, responsive design is not going to fix your content problem. Responsive design is a technique that enables the front end of the website, the client side code, to reflow itself for different sizes of screens. That's a great technique. It is a super valuable one to have in our arsenal. But it's not going to solve the questions that you need to solve about what you are going to do with your content, how you are going to restructure and clean up your content so it works on mobile. I, did the, I led the redesign of the New York Times back in 2005, 2006. And one of the things that you learn when you work with, with large-scale publishers is that they have a process in place for developing alternate sizes of things. So for example, any large publisher, whenever they have an image that appears, they will buy, you know, as a standard process, they will cut half a dozen different crop sizes of that image. And so when you look at something like this, I hope it's clear that you can see that in a sense, these are all the same image. They are all an image that could be used to stand in for that picture, wherever that story might appear, whether that appears on the home page or on a landing page or you know, in any other context that, that you might need an image. You can pick any one of these images. And they are the same image in a sense, but they are not identical images. They are not exactly the same image. So, if the idea that a publisher might make a package of image crops and then be able to use that across the wide range of contexts that they might need it to appear, if that makes sense for you, to you, then you can kind of wrap your head around what that might mean for doing something similar for text. Another one of my little pet peeves in the industry is publishers that truncate their headlines. I mean, it's like Daily Beast here was obviously like, oh, well, I mean, we can't possibly have enough room to show the entire headline. I mean, that would totally take away from our ability to have a giant glob of white space in the middle of the page. <laughs> NPR. So NPR is like my go-to example of how to do structured digital content right. And NPR truncates their headlines in their mobile app. The Guardian. The Guardian has an entire Tumblr devoted to celebrating the work of the tireless men and women who shorten headlines so they'll fit on your phone. And you know, people say to me sometimes, like, well, Karen, I mean, I, yeah, I get why this isn't great, but you know, it's an easy strategy. And it's like, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> Again, we are better than this as an industry. 
So rather than thinking about just taking the headline from desktop and shoving it into another context, you may want to think about creating alternate forms of headlines. So thinking about having a short form and a long form, like a 70 character, 60, 70 character version and a 100, 250, 150 character version. Slate magazine recently employed this strategy by cutting a short form and a long form of their headlines so that they could use the short form on social channels like Twitter. They got a 100% click-through increase on, their short, on the short form of their headlines. And it's, not, it's easy to see why. Like A headline that is written for that context, that is written to work well in that medium, is going to perform better than a headline that you are just randomly truncating because it wouldn't fit. Similarly, Organizations might think about cutting alternate forms of things to, so that the tone or the style is appropriate for different contexts. I worked with an organization recently that said they had uh, a page title that they were using on their pages and that the SEO team, like the information architecture team, wanted that to be this really like keyword rich, densely packed headline that would work great for search and for findability. But they said, we're having some conflict because the editorial team also uses that same title as the subject line of the email newsletters. And so the editorial team wants that subject line to be really flowery and creative and maybe have a pun in it. And that's completely at odds with the goals of this SEO team for having a lot of keywords packed in there. And I was like, so cut two versions. And they were like, you can do that? I'm like, you can do whatever you want. It's computers. You can do anything. It just takes you sitting down and planning. How is this system going to work? What are your goals for the publication? And how much editorial effort do you want to put into it? But thinking about cutting alternate verms, versions that will work in different contexts is actually something that pays off. And you're going to need that, not just for things like headlines, but also for things like summaries. So Blockbuster here is an example. The whole point of this page is to get you to read a description about a movie, decide that you're interested in it, and choose to rent that movie. Except Blockbuster was like, oh man, we've got so much other cruft we have to put on that page. We can't possibly allocate enough real estate so that you can actually read the full description of the movie. So instead, they give you three lines on desktop. They give you two lines on mobile. And then if you find out that you actually want to read more, you have to tap or click to see the full description. Except sometimes you wind up getting like four more words. It's a terrible experience, because it basically shows that they're more focused on cramming a bunch of stuff on the page than they are in thinking about what the user experience is for somebody who wants to come in and read this information. Blockbuster is bankrupt. You know why? Digital native business Netflix. So Netflix, when faced with that problem, came up with a completely different solution. Netflix cuts a long form and a short form of their movie descriptions. And then they use the short form or the long form every single place it needs to appear without truncating. You can watch Netflix on something like 400 different unique device types. You can watch Netflix on your phone, on your tablet, on your desktop, on your TV. You can watch it on your toaster. <laughs> and they never need to truncate the description because they basically put the effort into saying, we will write a short form and a long form of that description, and then our designers will know the pieces that we are working with so that we don't ever have to truncate. And these challenges are things that will come out in lots of places when you are making the leap to mobile. I'm pretty sure that there's somebody at Verizon who knows the difference between backup assistant, backup assistant plus, and backup assistant SM. I don't. So if my job here today is that I want to back up my phone, I have to do this laborious tap and hunt and click and look at what's in there and decide if it's what I want. And if it's not what I want, I have to tap back out and read the information. It's a bad experience that's called pogo sticking. And it's a sign that the site isn't very well designed. Jared Spool says that this is a problem because the user doesn't have enough context to know if what she's tapping on is the information that she wants. Comcast, when faced with this problem, solved it by simply writing a little short one sentence description of what every one of those things are. So if my job here today is that I want to change my pin, 
Could I figure out that that lived under accounts and identification? Nah, sure, maybe. But the fact that that description has the magic keyword pin in it makes me feel 100% confident that I'm going to get what I want when I tap. And those little descriptions, they don't write themselves. Somebody will have to think through what is the system, what's the strategy for creating all of these little bits of content. And I want to emphasize this. You're not creating content for a specific context. It's not that you're saying, oh, that's my iOS description, or that's my Twitter headline. What you're doing is thinking about a system of different sizes in exactly the same way that a publisher would think about a system of different image sizes. And if you think, if you think about how that system might work, you will wind up with content that gives you more value in the future, because you can use it in more places. Let me leave you with this. You don't get to decide what device somebody uses to go on the internet. They get to decide that. And so it's our mission, it is our responsibility to provide a great experience to people. Whatever device or platform or screen size or resolution they choose to use to go online. And so when you look at where mobile is at today, I know it's easy to fall into the trap of thinking, well, nobody's going to do that on mobile. Why would anybody want to do that on their phone? The truth is that disruptive technologies eventually get good. Eventually, there will not be a point where anybody will ask, why would somebody want to do that on their phone? In fact, it will just be assumed that, the, that mobile or smartphones or tablets is the primary way that most people want to go online. And they're going to get there not by replicating the same experience that we have on the desktop web today. No. They're going to do it in their own unique way. They are going to redefine what good means. And so that is why I am so excited about the opportunities posed by mobile. This is our chance to actually do mobile right and do it right right from the start. This is an opportunity for us to sweep away badly planned web development processes, content that doesn't meet the user's needs, content management systems that are difficult to use. This is our chance to actually go in and clean up some of the things that have been wrong for a decade. This is a big chance for everybody, and I hope you take advantage of it. Thank you. <laughs>